Uh, my question is to Dr. Avazi. Uh, in your process of your nanocrystalline cellulose, using sulfuric acid, to what amount of sulfuric acid would you be using in a 100 kilogram plant? And then how much hydro or sodium hydroxide would you have to use to treat to recycle that? I'm not setting you up, but I want an answer. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Of course, balancing out between what uh, concentration of sulfuric acid does also do the job is important. Uh, theoretically, they're talking about 58%. Currently, we're using 64 Ooh. for certain species and a little lower for other species, that softwood and hardwoods, depending on where the feedstock is coming from. What we have learned on the bench scale is quite different than when you take it to a larger scale. On bench, bench top, we can get easily a homogeneous mixture, which seems that the acid penetrates better. When we take it to a larger scale, we see different. I believe the ratio is 10 to 1 on bone dry pulp, 1 to 10 sulfuric acid. And uh, the amount that required is based on this uh, sulfate salt that is formed by using sodium hydroxide. If I do remember the numbers well, uh, I presume that the amount of sulfuric acid is a, for one kilo is about, I think, uh, 10, 10 and, is, and sodium hydroxide to neutralize all the acid to its corresponding, of course, salt and water. Please. Uh, we should talk later because I represent a company called Nano Green Biorefineries and Blue Goose Biorefineries, which right. is a non-toxic process right. with higher yields. Right. The difference between uh, using different acids is about the charges. Sulfuric acid, or so-called uh, 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 use of sulfuric acid in producing CNC, it produces the sulfonic group on the surface of the fiber that allows the suspension and instability. Of course, you could use different type and create so-called carboxylated uh, CNC. That also has a different properties. No one is better than the other one. Your process is quite different. You're using different materials, of course. If I use phosphoric acid, for example, because acid is what chops off those amorphous, I get up to 70% yield, which is quite impressive. Unfortunately, that behavior and properties that associate with the CNC is not there. So these are the pro and cons about what type of acid, how much of it you're going to use, and what type of feedstock. Is a combination of tweaking so fine that you can exactly get that frequency that you want to get your yield to be at. But I'd be more than glad to, to talk. Uh, there's a uh, questioner right here. Um, I would like, like to ask Dr. Lin. Um, is it possible what you guys develop to look into the viruses and bacteria and uh, imagine uh, in emergency services? or EMS, that before even our even client, you know, patient come to hospital, that we can do some of the quick analysis and find out what potential bacteria, viruses, and before we bring patient to the hospital. I see that much more implication on the healthcare mm -hmm. than anything else. So to avoid the issues or some of the horrendous things what happen in the hospital regarding to the viruses and bacteria. Yeah, certainly um, there's that a whole myriad of applications in the healthcare realm. It takes about 45 minutes to run the PCR. As long as we have DNA that's specific for an organism, it can, we can run it through the instrument. Again, it may take some finessing because of the kind of samples, but I know from Linda's previous work, they've been able to do um, cancer cells and STDs relatively quickly. So it could be used in that application as well, no problem. At the back. Um, it could be from the fertilizers, it could be animals in the environment. One of the things that we know about um, the interaction of the organisms and the vegetable material itself, um, there have been outbreaks and one of the classical ones was in Japan where people, uh, over 2,000 people got sick from eating radish sprouts with E. coli 157H7. They weren't on the surface, they were in the tissue. So as if the plant's contaminated or the seed is contaminated, that plant material can grow around that organism and, and cap, almost encapsulate it. So it, it's a mixture of, of what's in the soil, um, 
what's, what we're using, the animals that are around. I love it when people say, well, I grew it in my own garden, it must be safe. Um, <laughs> That's like your waitress. <laughs> yeah. You know, do birds poop on your plant material? Absolutely. Once, once something is on the surface of a plant material, it's really hard to get it off um, once an organism has attached. So. Can E. coli grow on just about anything? It's not about growth. It's about being there. Because the infective dose, especially for the sugar toxin producing E. coli, like 0157, the infective dose is only 10 cells. I don't yeah. need it to grow. Yeah, yeah. I just need it to be there. So we need to do everything we can to keep it out of the food supply, right from what happens on the farms right through. Great. So. Would yeah. organics be a higher risk? <laughs> 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 oh, uh, that's not contentious. So, I actually, I actually teach the food safety course, and this is something that students always ask me. So there is absolutely no scientific evidence to say that conventional or organic is any safer or less safe. So we don't have the scientific evidence one way or another to say. So we don't have to worry about not eating our vegetables because we eat our vegetables. Well, um, <laughs> well, cantaloupe. I've always been looking for an excuse not to eat cantaloupe. <laughs> If you wash it properly, there's no problem. You scrub it, not wash it. Scrub it. Um, one of the things that we know is that things are there. We try and do everything we can do to reduce the risk for cons consumers. And that's what it's all about, is just trying to reduce the risk. Eating is risky business, but not eating is even riskier. <laughs> uh, do we have a... Yes. This question is for Dr. Avazi, please. You showed us all of the applications for CNC, a wide array, everything from medical to fracking to plane wings. Can you explain a little more what makes CNC so special? Sure. Although uh, most of pulp and paper have actually mastered uh, a lot of aspects and uh, research procedures into how to optimize and extract pulp out of the uh, wood species, different wood species, that when it comes to CNC, we are at the point of infancy, and we need to learn more about it. As we speak, AITF proudly holds two uh, patents. One of them is on the icing of the airplane wings, uh, especially in the cold weather, and the other one is for oil and gas. As we speak, uh, FP Innovation holds 24 patents, Slambrege, I think, in the order of 40 or 50. Halliburton is not you know, behind from that either, simply because they can behave diversely in different applications. My spouse is actually waiting for the day that he can apply the uh, personal care, such as the uh, nail polish, because of his properties that provides. Upon the reflection of light, that it can provide a rainbow of different colors. And she's looking forward to, to use that one day. In paint, coating, um, of course, because of its properties, shears, strength, and modulus that has provided. At 10% CNC, we can look at it and we see something like a Vaseline. It's quite viscous. Yes, if you give it a shake, it starts to flow. And that's a property that most of uh, uh, oil and gas industry is using to replace petroleum-based polymers for uh, uh, different applications, drilling mods, and so on and so forth. And that's another uh, patent that AITF is holding right now. So because of his properties, because of his, although chemical properties seems to be the same, but the physical morphology of it, and you're learning more and more, the way you dry it is actually going to produce or open up new niche markets. In fact, I think CPRO is sitting here. They have a unique process in which actually allow us to convert that small sparkles of CNC into the cotton candy-like material that can be used in biocomposites or uh, catheters, biomedicals actually. So these are the properties that he's bringing, and we're trying to explore more and more. Advanced equipments, University of Alberta, SCM, TEM, TGs are being in uh, uh, research and actually uh, trying to figure out what are the applications, what are the properties, and what are the materials that you can bring to the table in order to connect between what we produce and what can be used in the real market. Did that answer your question? Uh, there's a person with his hand up uh, over here down toward the front? Or what were we doing years ago with hamburger? Could you, uh, could you wait for a mic, actually, please? Because we have to record these. Thanks. Hang on. It's right, right there. Uh, Richard Shahaney again. Uh, 
I was a quality control inspector in Canada Packers in the beef boning room during my college days. Uh, I don't remember killing anybody back then. I don't even remember any infected hamburger. We made piles of hamburger for A&W, who was the biggest customer at the time. Uh, is, are we just that much more knowledgeable now of what's happening than we were before? Well, I think the organisms have probably always been there. We just haven't linked human infection to the organism. Um, I talked about the outbreak in 1993. It certainly wasn't the first one. The first one that where there was a direct link between E. coli and ground beef um, and human disease was actually 1982 in the U.S. And some people died, but it didn't hit the media. Um, yeah. So I suspect that the, the organisms have probably always been there. We just haven't been able to make the link. And we're much better at making links today between human disease and where those organisms came from than we have ever been able to do. What about steak tartare? I won't eat it. <laughs> um, you've got ground, ground raw meat um, and raw egg. So double whammy. Um, uh, I did, have I you did. ever had the one with cantaloupe, egg, and <laughs> ground meat? I have to confess, I did eat raw ground beef ground with raw pork when I was in Germany. I did, tasted it just because I had to. Um, and I have had hamburgers cooked too rare, but it's always been irradiated meat. Um, yes. My name is Christophe Danuma from Albert Innovate Technology Features. Uh, we have uh, listened very good presentation today. One side we have uh, Benji with uh, CNC, and the other side we have uh, two aspects in detections. And uh, my, my question is, is there any way to make those sites communicate together? Uh, I mean, for example, for uh, the Alzheimer disease or prion disease, we know that CNC is not, non, is not toxic and is also biodegradable. Is it possible to attach those specific molecules to CNC and use them as a drug delivery or for diagnosis? And uh, for the other side, you talk about uh, using plastic to, to mix your material, I, I guess is to prepare your material before analysis. Is it possible, for example, to have some specific uh, ingredient in those plastic to make like uh, what we call composite in such a way that when we wrap a meat with that, we can release those uh, uh, active uh, ingredient and detect if there is a uh, collide or not. Thank you. So let, let me start. Let me start by talking about the size of the CNCs. Are you, are you talking about the RIF in, in terms of the detection? Okay. Uh, currently, we are working with a number of scientists in pharmaceutical uh, department of University of Alberta, in which you're interested. Uh, if you notice. Uh, right around the glucose, you have hydroxyl groups. Those hydroxyl are easy, can be modified with different, of course, uh, reaction. Uh, as we speak, currently there's a project ongoing. We try to use it for cancer therapy, in which we can actually tag into those hydroxyl groups. So, in other way, we can eliminate the hydrogen, deprotonate it, and attach to the ether bond as naturally as being produced in tree into that specific drug delivery. And because of its size, it can penetrate, hopefully, selectively into those cells that are susceptible and creating that spe specific disease. And they have the facility and capabilities, not me, but they do, in making it either through the gel, capsules, or any other type of, type of forms. And this is just a beginning. And of course, the role of AI Bio is to review this type of uh, applications, examine the potential of it and its effect upon the economy and the well-being, so-called ESBA. And this is, this is why they've always been instrumental in bringing us together, going through those reviews, and saying go or no go, or perhaps fund that in terms of the first or second feasibilities. Your second question is about the packaging. Unfortunately, CNC is fragile. That means if you're going to use it to wrap the food against oxygen, which is quite imprimable, you need to modify that further. 
One way of modification is by using polyvinyl alcohol, or PVA. And science has shown if you do that, then you can make it more flexible. Again, the question falls in with respect to the economics. Can we use this material to be cost effective for packaging company to protect that food against fungal or bacterial attack? So my job and yours, as a part of my team, is to make sure to get the cost to a level that can actually open up market for it. By doing so, we help our partners, Alpac and Mills alike, also with the companies such as CPRO, to come up with novel ideas in order to make that a reality. That's how much of the Ted, do you have a comment? <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm broadening your question a little bit. Your first question is, is a good one about CNCs and the role in disease or drug delivery. Um, and we certainly could see a role for our zebrafish as a complement to more traditional models like um, a mouse model of, of studying drug delivery. So if we had multiple variants on CNCs, and, and I, I would understand from your chemistry that that would be possible, that uh, we would be very interested in which were most effective and which were more toxic, et cetera, in the zebrafish, because we can have thousands of them at a time and array them out, and for their ideal for drug trials, that that would really be um, a perfect platform to, to try and do that sort of work. Yeah. Great. Uh, and I think probably the last question, yes? Okay, this question is for Ling. It's very interesting uh, talk. I'm an engineer, so I will ask one or two engineering questions. Based on the talk, <laughs> what is the difference between that shoebox machine you're using versus the PCR and the real-time PCR? Because for the E. coli detection in the lab, we can license a cell and culture it and can detect it within the time. Second one is you mentioned it's five hours can detect, but five hours, but probably the XL already have the food, already shipping out or packaged, and you're tracking back, you don't know where it is after five hours. Okay, to answer your first question, it, it, the gel cycler, um, the advantage of it is, is that we, can, we, just, we don't do anything to the sample to extract the DNA. It's just the E. coli cells that go in there. Everything that we need to be able to do the DNA extraction and the PCR is in the gel cassettes. So there's no sample prep. So it's a very, very simple system. Um, typically when you're running PCR, you've got to extract some DNA, unless you're doing colony PCR, and there's a, there's a whole pile of steps in there. This is just a, a raw sample into the equipment, into the cassette, and put it in, push a button. And yeah, it's a standard PCR, um, but it's very, very quick. And right now, one of the things that they're doing um, with the Alberta Machine Learning is trying to get um, faster heating and cooling so we can get those melt curves faster. So right now the PCR reaction is 45 minutes. We're hoping to get it down to about 20 minutes, I would hope, um, so we can shorten that time frame. One of the, one of the goals when um, the call for proposals first went out was that we have a machine that we can sit in the plant right beside the meat and detect. And because we have to do an enrichment step to get the numbers up because they are so low, there is no way any meat company is going to let E. coli grow right beside their meat that they're producing. So this has to go into a laboratory. Um, as far as the timeline for shipping meat, one of the things and we've been doing, I've talked to a lot of the people in the meat industry, including the people that now own XL Meats and Cargill, and what they want is something where they can make a decision within an eight-hour shift. Um, so that they can make those decisions and they know exactly that that sample came from that combi bin. They track it very, very well. And one of the things that um, Patrick is, Polarski is doing is developing a system where we can integrate how we track the sample into what, how they track their meat in the processing plant so that there's a direct link between the result and where that meat is in their processing plant. Thank you for all the questions.